Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, so it's a pleasure to have Mariana Rakova speaking today. Uh, Mariana is a graduate student at Columbia University. Uh, she's interned at MSR Redmond already uh, twice, and I guess this is her third internship. Uh, the first two years she was interning with the crypto group, and this year she's interning with the security and privacy group. And I guess she'll be talking about multi-party computation today. Thanks, Annie, for the introduction. And uh, I'm very happy to give this talk here. Uh, this is uh, joint work with uh, people at Columbia, University of Maryland, and Bell Apps. Uh, these are Dov Gordon, Jonathan Katz, Vlad Kolesnikov, Tal Malkin, and Yevgeny Valis. And today I'm going to present our work that uh, achieves uh, secure computation with uh, sublinear amortized work. So, uh, Let's start with uh, defining what is the problem of uh, secure computation. And uh, let's go to our scenario where we have uh, Bob and Alice. And uh, they have some function that they want to compute together. And this function depends on the inputs that both Bob and Alice have. So uh, they want to run some protocol that uh, allows them to uh, get the output of this function that depends on uh, both of their inputs. So, and what is the goal in secure multi-party computation is to be able to do this computation of the function so that the only thing that is revealed at the end of the protocol is the output of the function. And what you don't want to reveal is anything related to the inputs that are entered in this functionality or any of the intermediate state uh, that's been computed during the execution of the protocol. And for the rest of uh, the talk, we, we can think of this function as our running example will be the function that allows uh, Alice to search uh, the database of Bob. So Bob has some database and Alice wants to find something in this database. So the function that uh, uh, they want to compute is uh, just uh, finding this value. And uh, now looking at what we want to be uh, revealed and what want to be hidden from this execution of the protocol is that uh, we want to review the matched value at the end. And we want, for example, to hide what are the positions in the database were accessed during this search protocol. So maybe this search involved looking at several different positions until you reach what you are looking for. And what we want to hide is uh, uh, this access, uh, access uh, positions. So uh, secure multi-party computation have been around for a very, very long time. and. Uh, its result, its main result, is a very impressive one, and it claims that uh, we can securely compute any function. So now we were, I was talking for this one example function, which is the, the search functionality, but secure multi-party computation says that we have a way to uh, perform this uh, evaluation securely for any, uh, any function. So, and what is the idea of most of the protocols? is that we want to do the computation looking at the circuit that's representing this functionality. So we start either with a Boolean circuit or arithmetic circuit. In one case, we have gates that are ands and ors. And in the other case, we have uh, gates that are arithmetic uh, uh, operations, uh, times and plus. And then the computation goes through the evaluation of this whole circuit where uh, the parties interact to evaluate each of the gates in this whole circuit. So this is the main underlying idea in almost all of the existing secure multi-party computation uh, protocols. So on the one hand, we have this very impressive result that we can do secure computation uh, on any functionality. But the problem with many of these approaches, almost all of them, is that they are very inefficient. And this inefficiency somehow seems to be inherent in, in these approaches. And there are a few main reasons why this inefficiency uh, is inherent. Uh, so the, per the first reason that we can look at is uh, that the definition of privacy requires you when you have a huge input, uh, in order to preserve privacy, you, you have to touch every uh, single data point in your input. 
And why is that uh, uh, a requirement? Because uh, if you have somebody who is holding your data and you perform some computation that doesn't touch, for example, the first 10 records, uh, the guy who is holding this data already immediately learns that uh, whatever computation you were per performing didn't need uh, this part of, of the database. And this already leaks something about the computation, about the use of the data, and depending what is his external uh, knowledge of this data that is stored, uh, this can reveal uh, some information uh, about your private computation to, to, this, uh, to this party. So the next, the next reason is that uh, comes from the nature of this computation that works on circuits. And the, the problem there is that if you want to do computation on circuits that involves uh, a huge database, you are required to take this database as input to your circuit. And once you, uh, you include this whole database as input uh, to your circuit, uh, this means that the size of your circuit will be at least linear in the size of your database. So you have, if you have to deal with a huge database, you know that the circuit that will correspond to the evaluation of any function on this huge database will have to be uh, already linear in the size of the database. And uh, the third reason that we can identify uh, when we are working with circuits and computation on circuits is that if you have some program that uh, has many different branches and they don't uh, they get executed under different conditions on your input if you're expressing this uh, functionality as a circuit then uh, you have inherently to go through the evaluation of all the branches of your of your program so uh, this again uh, requires that uh, if you have uh, input of size n, then uh, any computation that follows the, uh, the paradigm of uh, circuits as uh, your uh, representation of, of your function uh, will have to take uh, time at least linear in the size of, of the database. So this is what we can achieve with existing uh, uh, secure multiparty computation that uh, uses uh, circuits as, as its tool, and now let's let's try to forget for a minute about secure computation and looks what what happens uh, in practice when we uh, when we try to compute some functionalities uh, without uh, caring caring about security. So if we go back to our example with the search functionality, if we have sorted data or hashed data, then uh, the in order to execute a search protocol on a uh, big database of n records is no longer uh, doesn't need to take uh, linear time uh, we have algorithms such as binary search that requires logarith logarithmic uh, complexity in the size of the database or if we use something like hash tables then we have just a constant number of lookups so uh, now that we have this example where we looked at a uh, algorithm that doesn't have to be uh, secure, we see that we somehow managed to overcome this need to touch everything in the database. So what we can conclude is that existing uh, secure multi-party computation uh, with large databases somehow inherently stop us from taking advantage of, of these uh, uh, algorithms that without the security uh, requirement actually allow us to, to achieve a sublinear uh, computational complexity. So. Uh, basically, uh, this means that using existing uh, techniques, uh, uh, computation on very large database is to the most part very inefficient and very far from, from practical uh, uses. So in this work, uh, we try to answer the, the question, can we do better? Can we try to fill this gap that is between uh, existing algorithms for insecure computation and uh, uh, algorithms that compile them actually in insecure protocols. So in order to, to be able to, to do anything in that direction, we really have to uh, look at uh, computational complexity in the amortized sense. Uh, and what does it mean, uh, amortized complexity? This means that we will look at the uh, uh, average uh, computational uh, complexity over several multiple executions of a protocol. So. Uh, in, our, in the context of what we were with what we'll be doing with secure computation, uh, multiple executions can be viewed as uh, executions of different uh, functions on the same uh, database, computation on, with the same database but different functions. Or maybe we can think of uh, execution of the same function 
that has two, time, two types of inputs. One of the inputs that is provided by the, one of the parties is a small one, and this one will be changing with each different execution. And then we have the big uh, input that will be provided by the other guy, and this big input will be some database that will be staying constant. If we are thinking about our search example, maybe we have one huge database, and then the small inputs for the different execution is that uh, uh, one of the parties will be searching for many different things in the different executions of the protocol. So, and we'll be, we want to achieve this sublinear uh, computational complexity when we looked at the amortized uh, computational complexity over several executions. And why do we have to do this? Is because of this inherent requirement that for privacy you have to touch all the records. And the question is, do you have to touch them every time you want to execute your uh, protocol, you, or you ha can touch them once in the beginning in some pre-processing stage, and then from that point on you can leverage off and achieve uh, uh, sublinear complexity. So. And as I pointed out, uh, circuits uh, on their own don't prevent us from achieving this improvement just by the nature of the, the way the computation happens in circuits. That's why we look at a different type of computational model, namely the random access machine, which is basically the computational model that's closest to what happens in the real CPU and how a real CPU uh, works in, in its computation. So, a random access machine model allows us basically to uh, achieve running time that's sublinear in the input size. So, we, so which is to say that if your insecure computation uh, is uh, sublinear time in the size of the input, uh, your RAM machine is reflecting exactly this computational complexity. And also, when we are using a RAM access machine and we have uh, a program that can have several different branches, basically the execution of the program doesn't really have to go through all the branches, but it takes exactly the branch uh, that's necessary for the particular type of, of uh, input. And this, is, uh, this gives us leverage to, to achieve uh, better efficiency. So uh, our, if, if I want to summarize in one slide what, uh, what is exactly that, uh, that we managed to achieve is that uh, if we have, we, we give a protocol that allows two-party computation protocol uh, uh, where you have input of size n and then you are running uh, uh, some algorithm that takes the instructions uh, uh, on a RAM machine when it is executed as a RAM machine and the, com the computational overhead that we achieve in the amortized sense uh, for the execution of the protocol in a, se in a secure uh, in a secure construction uh, is basically a uh, uh, cube logarithm in the size of the database or the size of the length of your program, depending which is the largest one. And uh, in terms of memory storage that's required uh, from the two parties, uh, we have that one party uh, can be very uh, uh, limited in its memory and it requires only constant uh, memory and then the other party who will hold the whole database, the big database, uh, uh, requ is required to have uh, storage that's linear in the size of the database. So uh, our contributions can be uh, viewed as two main points. Uh, first, we give a generic solution for sublinear two-party computation that basically uh, proposes a compiler that takes uh, any uh, RAM uh, protocol and any secure two-party uh, computation protocol and uh, uh, provides uh, a new compiled version of the uh, secure multi-party computation protocol uh, in the RAM model. And for this, uh, the only tools that we need is uh, some generic two-party computation protocol and some oblivious uh, RAM protocol. And it seems a little bit like cheating that we'll be achieving uh, our improvement in uh, efficiency by using generic two-party computation protocol, uh, which will go eventually back to the uh, uh, garbled circuit uh, uh, to the circuit uh, evaluation. But the the point will be that we will find a way to reduce uh, the places where we have to resort back to this generic uh, two-party computation to very small parts of our uh, overall uh, execution. So uh, this is the generic uh, result. And then we will 
uh, look at some optimized e efficiency construction where we'll look at specific instantiations of this uh, uh, oblivious uh, RAM uh, protocol. We'll look uh, at the construction of goldreich ostrovsky And uh, then for the generic two-party computation protocol, uh, we will use uh, uh, the Yao protocol uh, for garbled circuits. So, and just as an example, uh, in the case of binary search, we try to uh, do a, a comparison where uh, we count uh, how many gates, basically uh, the gates that we would need if we involve, if we use uh, a generic two-party computation protocol uh, as it is for the whole uh, database, and then compare it to, to what happens when we instantiate uh, our construction with a RAM protocol for the same size of database. So we looked at, at an example where we have uh, a database with uh, 10 to the seventh records and each of size 10 to the fifth bits. And in this case, uh, our improvement uh, in efficiency uh, is about to give us about 200 times improvement in the size of the uh, garbled circuits that will need to be uh, evaluated. So why, why is this interesting? Why is this a new computational model interesting to consider? Is because it will be uh, applicable in cases where we have some computation uh, that involves some uh, big database uh, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, uh, uh, we have one of the parties per involved in the computation to be uh, very limited in terms of uh, memory storage. So uh, in the context of cloud computing, uh, we can see as the big powerful party who is uh, uh, storing the uh, database to be instantiated as the cloud, and then uh, any little client that is uh, interacting with the cloud uh, provider will be the party that basically will be limited uh, uh, in, in terms of its uh, memory storage. And of course, cloud computing uh, and uh, in this context have many applications to medical records, financial data, location-based services. Uh, uh, so we, that's, that's where we see application of the types of protocol that we are uh, developing. So uh, to give you some uh, background uh, on the related work that uh, exists in this area, uh, there have been uh, several recently several protocols that uh, look at oblivious RAM and uh, uh, I will define formally what oblivious RAM is later but uh, just uh, to give you uh, an idea oblivious RAM basically tries to uh, handle the problem of uh, access pattern leakage if you have a huge database and you are accessing uh, different uh, parts of that database how can you do this uh, without uh, requiring uh, touching of every single record in the database and at the same time hiding from the, uh, from the server, for example, who is storing your database, hiding what, what uh, parts of your database you are really accessing. So there have been, uh, the first work on oblivious RAM was by uh, Godrach and Ostrovsky in 96. And then recently last year, there have been some work by Pincus and Ryman, iType by Damgard, Melgard and Nielsen. Uh, that have further uh, developed uh, uh, the schemes for oblivious RAM. And recently, there have been even more works that haven't appeared yet in conferences, but uh, appear a lot in ePrint if you're looking there. So in terms of uh, computational models, uh, the majority of uh, secure multi-party computation works rely on circuits and use circuits as their underlying computation model. Uh, there have been a few different models that uh, uh, that were used in the several different papers. One of them is uh, branching programs. Uh, another one is uh, uh, OBDDs, uh, which is basically a canonical representation for Boolean formulas. You can view them as, as, canon as this type of computations. And uh, then there have been works that consider circuits with uh, lookup tables. Uh, the work of Damgard, Melgard, and Nielsen actually has a paragraph that mentions uh, that we can do computation uh, using oblivious RAM, uh, but their model is uh, different and they do not uh, uh, require constant uh, 
memory storage for either of their participants, and uh, they do not address really, they, their goal is not really to, to achieve sublinear uh, computational uh, complexity. So, and bottom line is that neither of these uh, different computational models manages to go uh, underneath this sublinear uh, computational complexity requirement for the protocol. So, for the rest of the talk, I will present to you our two contributions, which is the generic protocol and the optimized version. And uh, for that purpose, I will introduce you to the RAM computation model, how it's formally defined. I will tell you what is an oblivious RAM scheme, and then I will uh, show you what is our generic compile, compiler for uh, multi-party computation from using RAM uh, machine computation, uh, computational models. And then uh, I will show you how do we how we use the construction of Goder Hostrovsky uh, uh, for oblivious RAM uh, to get our optimized uh, protocol. So uh, let's start by looking uh, at the RAM, RAM computational model. So uh, we can view RAM computation as uh, execution of a sequence of instructions. And you can think again uh, of the CPU where you have a series of instructions that tell you what memory you want to fetch and then what type of computation you want to execute. So each instruction in our case is either read or write uh, data from some particular uh, memory address. And then after uh, this read or write of memory, you have some a little computation uh, which we will call this get next instruction because this uh, computation both uh, transforms your data and does a little piece of the computation that you need to perform, but it also uh, tells you what what should be the next instruction that you will be executed, uh, executing, whether you need to do a read or write uh, on a data and in which memory location you need to, uh, to do this read or write. So, uh, just to try to illustrate what happens with this uh, RAM protocol is that we have, uh, in, the, in the sense of two-party computation, is that we have uh, two parties and uh, then we have the RAM protocol. So one of the parties, Alice, sends her data. This is the, the party that has a very small data and it sends it to the RAM protocol. And then from that point on, the execution uh, uh, proceeds as uh, the RAM protocol tells what data it needs to, to receive. The other party sends that piece of data. The RAM protocol uh, does the computation it needs, and it says whether you, it needs to write any data back, and so on and so forth. Uh, at the end of the protocol, uh, it computes the function, the, the value of the function, and it sends it back to the, uh, to the party uh, that's supposed to receive the output of the functionality. So I hope that it's clear what the RAM computation model is. And if you have any questions, uh, uh, like you should ask them now, because from now, from here on, I will rely on this computation model to, to tell you how, how we'll make our protocol secure. So, so two-party series act as memory. Sorry? Two-party series act as memory. They just store their own. No, so here one party, uh, the first party, Alice, uh, is supposed to have a very small input. So which is a constant memory and she can just give it to the uh, to the computation. If it's a longer input, you can view it as using this ORAM structure, you can store the input of both parties in the same ORAM structure and just store it at one of the parties from that point on. Because the ORAM structure gives you protection for the data, whether it's your data or whether it's the other party's data as well, uh, you, you get this protection. So if we want to go back to our binary search uh, example and we want to think how we can see, uh, perceive binary search as a uh, RAM computation uh, function, uh, the function that we can see as get next instruction is the one that tells us which element we have to look in the database for the binary search. Binary search works as you have some sorted array and then you start looking in the middle and you, you figure out from, from that point whether you have to look to the left or you have to look to the right. So basically, uh, the get next instruction uh, function, which is performing the computation for us, uh, will be deciding exactly which 
position you have to look in the next step of the search. And then uh, the state information that needs to be kept for the execution of the binary search is basically the boundaries of the subarray that still needs to be checked in, in your search. So uh, in this case, you start always by looking in the middle position in the array, then uh, your state remembers which half will next have to be searched. And at the next update for the next get instruction, you will basically uh, uh, learn the next position that you have to look at. So now, if we want to think of uh, uh, RAM machines and how we want to do secure computation on RAM machines, uh, we first have to consider the get next instruction, the one that is doing the secure computation. So we will need to find a way to implement this uh, computation, uh, computational instruction in such a way that uh, neither of the parties learn uh, what is the current state that's uh, kept in the RAM machine, uh, neither the result of this instruction, basically what will be looked in memory or uh, whether it would be a write or read instruction, uh, nor what will be the new state and the new instruction that will be that will have to be executed next. So this should be the uh, security that is provided for the execution of this uh, computational step. And then apart from that, uh, neither party that is executing this protocol uh, will have to, should be able to learn anything about the inputs that are being accessed. Because at each, after each of these get next instruction uh, execution steps, uh, we'll have to fetch different uh, pieces uh, of, info of data from, from memory, we'll either for the read or for the write. So basically, we'll need to guarantee that uh, this uh, sequence of uh, memory lookups that we are doing are still not leaking to either of the parties. Like now we have two parties that we are not leaking to uh, either of them information of what piece of the database is, is being used. So uh, this, this is what we would need if we want in order to implement secure computation for uh, RAM models. And now as a main part for our uh, protocols, we will use protocols uh, uh, for oblivious RAM. And as I mentioned, the goal of an oblivious RAM protocol is to basically hide this access pattern in memory. If you have a huge database and you want to do uh, uh, queries and uh, access different types of uh, different uh, points in your database, how can you uh, hide uh, your access pattern uh, fr from, the, from the party that's storing the database? So an oblivious RAM uh, protocol basically allows you to compile uh, a lookup query. You, we can think of a lookup query as a, as a request for the data at a particular virtual address. And then how do you compile this uh, query into a sequence of uh, accesses of particular physical uh, locations. So we will have these differentiations of thinking that queries for particular data are done uh, using virtual uh, memory addresses. And then the data itself, uh, how it's stored in the physical memory and uh, where exactly you can find the piece of data that corresponds to virtual address five in the physical uh, memory, this will be translated uh, uh, through this sequence of access in of particular physical locations. So an oblivious RAM protocol will have to give you this, this type of uh, uh, algorithms that allow you to do this translation from virtual addresses into a, a sequence of physical locations so that uh, the server who is uh, accessing this particular physical location still have no idea what, what data you're really uh, accessing in your database. So now an ORAM uh, functionality can be viewed as these two uh, algorithms. Uh, one of the first one is basically allowing you to initialize the structure where you will be keeping your data and the, which will be called the ORAM structure. Basically this is, uh, this will tell you how to arrange your data in uh, physical memory. Uh, maybe if you need to shuffle it, if you need to uh, order it in any special way. And then the next uh, algorithm 
will be the algorithm that basically allows you to execute a, a read or write instruction. So this algorithm will take an instruction that uh, refers to particular virtual, virtual address that says read or write data to this particular address and then compiles it into a, this sequence of sub-queries that will be uh, referring to particular uh, physical addresses in memory. So this, this will be the, like, the basic kind of functionality that uh, you want to uh, receive from an, ORAM, uh, from an ORAM protocol. And the properties that you want uh, to be guaranteed from this ORAM protocol is, of course, correctness, that you are really, uh, your reads and writes are consistent. You are reading whatever was uh, uh, written. And then uh, the most important property is this access pattern hiding, which basically tells you that uh, just observing what has been accessed in memory uh, for two sequences of uh, instructions that are of the same length. So here A1 through AN and B1 through BN are sequences of instructions. Each of them uh, is either read or write at some particular uh, uh, virtual address. So for these two sequences of instructions, the uh, execution of the ORAM evaluation algorithm that allows you to access all these uh, addresses in memory uh, will be indistinguishable for anyone who is executing, uh, who is executing this algorithm. And of course, you want efficiency. You want to avoid this linear search. So you want to require that the execution of the uh, ORAM algorithm uh, achieves logarithmic complexity in the size of your uh, database. Otherwise, if we go to linear, then uh, we, we might as well scan the whole database and uh, just retrieve the, the data item that, that we needed. So uh, these, are, these were the, basically the definition of uh, ORAM functionality and the types of property that, uh, that we would need. So now we have the tools that we needed. We had the RAM uh, computation model and the RAM machines. And we have also this uh, uh, ORAM protocol. So now we can go uh, to, to our uh, generic construction. And let me remind you again, the goal will be to uh, uh, achieve multi-party computation protocol that allows you uh, to have sublinear amortized work for each of the executions uh, on the database. So. Now, for the generic protocol, the way it will proceed is that we'll have first this pre-processing stage, which would allow us to get rid of this requirement for privacy that we have to touch every single record in the database. So uh, the way this will be achieved is that we will uh, run a two-party computation protocol for the uh, initialization of the ORAM structure if we need to perform any, anything in the initialization of the ORAM structure, which only sets up the structure for, for, for where you would hold your memory. And then you would uh, execute a two-party secure computation uh, in order to insert each data point from the inputs of both parties in your ORAM structure. So this would be the part or the pre-processing which would uh, touch each point in the, in the database and in the inputs. And once you have them stored in this particular memory structure, from that point on, you will be able to uh, deal with any accesses to those uh, without having to, uh, to incur this uh, linear overhead. So now that we have done this pre-processing stage, uh, the execution for the protocols will go through this RAM uh, RAM model, where you will have the get next instruction, which provides you the next instruction and in the protocol. And then you have the execution of the instruction, which allows you to fetch the necessary uh, data from memory. So now the two party, the way they will do this is they will run a secure two party computation protocol. But note that this protocol is learned, is run only on this small uh, functionality, which is just the get next instruction uh, that allows you to get the next instruction and do a little piece of the computation. It doesn't need to, in, to be on the, whole, uh, on the whole protocol. So they will execute this 
uh, this uh, little function in a secure, in any generic secure multi-party computation protocol. And the inputs and the outputs that they will have for this uh, will be basically shares of the state of your RAM uh, protocol. So we were saying that in your RAM protocol, uh, you have a state that helps you get the next instruction that you have to, to uh, execute and also keep some little memory that allows you to do the computation to, to obtain your final result. So the way the two parties will be executing is that each of them will be holding a share of this state and then they will run a secure uh, two-party computation protocol for the execution of the small get next instruction. And in order to, to fetch the necessary data from memory, uh, they will have to do a two-party computation for the uh, ORAM eval function. So the ORAM eval function was the one that allows you to go to memory and retrieve the pieces of information that you would need. From the properties of the ORAM eval, we know that this access pattern would not leak any information about what data you are really uh, uh, accessing. And now, uh, in order to hide this from both parties, we will need to put this execution of the ORAM access in a, in a two-party computation protocol. So if you have questions about how this works, uh, Please ask me now. Uh, I hope that uh, the, yes. So for the these termination condition, how do you check for the quality inside of the, the multiplayer competition? So the, it will be again executed inside the uh, secure multi-party computation, the two part, just the output for the parties. In this case, when, when it's the stop condition will be something that each of them can, can interpret, right? The shares in this case will be directly, the two parties can interpret them as this is the stop condition. In, in, all, the other, in all the other previous steps, each of the shares will be a random thing that doesn't leak any information about the intermediate state of the protocol. But once you reach the stop condition, what you will be returning back will be something that each of them can interpret as Okay, we finished and we need to stop. So, any other questions? So yes, the, I guess I the point of, uh, so you said you, you use two-party computation to implement that evaluation uh, ORAM pro, uh, op procedure. Yes, the one that tells you what will be the next instruction, what next you need to fetch from memory. The point here is that we want to hide which, uh, what data is being accessed from both parties. Yeah, so this thing will be, will come from this part. So you, the get next instruction just tells you the next instruction is read memory 10. Once you have this, neither party will learn that the next instruction is read memory 10. They will have just shares of this instruction. And now with these shares, they will, execute this protocol, which again, the inputs of the, this protocol is the shares of the instruction. And the computation that will happen in this protocol will be the ORAM eval, which ORAM eval on its own gives you the sublinearity of access to the data and the access hiding. But the thing is that the ORAM on its own the guarantees that it gives you is only for one of the parties, the party that holds the database. Now in this context, because we are running it as a secure multi-party computation, you need to provide these privacy guarantees with respect to both parties. That's why uh, for this generic uh, construction, we put this in a two-party computation protocol. Next, when we go to the more efficient construction, you will see how exactly this happens in with respect to one particular ORAM protocol uh, and the functionality of that protocol. So the point is that, yeah? Malicious security or just honest security? This is honest but curious. All ORAM protocols are on only honest but curious. Yeah. All, all the instructions are stored in RAM as well. Sorry? All the instructions are stored in RAM. Right? So nothing, so the RAM, the this get next instruction has the property that it produces the next one only 
by looking what's the immediately the one that happened previously, immediately before it. You don't need to remember anything, everything in before. You have just this small state that allows you to compute the next instruction, but you don't need to store. Like your state for the ORAM is uh, small. It's not. It's not long. So, so the state of the ORAM is uh, is in the shares of the parties. Uh, what is shares? Oh, share means that you have some value, and you divide it in two pieces in such a way that if you look at one of the pieces on its own, doesn't doesn't review any information about this data. But when you have the two pieces together, uh, then you can recover the recover the so the data. No, so here, the, a two-party computation protocol has this property that uh, you have as inputs these two shares that don't reveal to each party anything, and then they execute this series of interactions, the two parties. The two parties execute this series of interactions. Okay. So there's like different types of things that they, they communicate, but the, the bottom line is that the properties that uh, two-party computation protocol that it gives you is that you learn nothing else except the output. And for the purposes of our overall execution here, the output is just another random share of the updated state. So what happens is that the two parties run this protocol in order to update their state, but the result, the output is still a random share. By just looking at what they received, they cannot understand what will be the next instruction? For example, that you will read memory five, or uh, what was the computation that, that happened? Until the end, they have just these random shares, and then at the end, when the protocol completes, the guy who was supposed to receive the output will, will get the two shares, and he will learn only the output, but nothing else that happened in, be in between. So with this generic, uh, construction, uh, we already achieve this uh, uh, logarithmic overhead uh, in, in terms of amortized computation uh, complexity. So if we have t instructions and then uh, memory of size n, the overhead compared to the insecure version that was running in, in time t uh, is this uh, logarithmic uh, logarithm to the third uh, in the size of the database or the size of the program. And I must point out that this logarithm to the third is really uh, has to be translated, uh, has to be interpreted as the complexity of the ORAM protocol. For logarithm to the third, we really used the Goldreich Ostrovsky protocol. We took the complexity from the Goldreich Ostrovsky, but if you have a ORAM protocol that achieves better, uh, better complexity, you can just plug it. Our, our construction is generic in the sense that you can use any ORAM protocol. You can just plug it and substitute the, the complexity with the new complexity of your, of your ORAM protocol. So are you saying that if the database is large enough and the amortized time doesn't depend on the length of computation or just that that term disappears? So the, the length of the computation, usually what happens is that uh, these instructions also get into the database in terms of with the reads and the writes. So somehow the database, the size of the database already reflects the, 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 the length of your computation because at each computation you will do something new to the database. So uh, yeah, I mean, well, when we have the efficient construction, I will have the computational complexity in much more fine grained in terms of sizes of records, number of records, number of instructions, yeah. But now I just wanted to like simplify what's going on. The communication complexity is uh, again logarithmic, but I think it's uh, log squared the overhead. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Now let's let's move to the uh, optimized protocol, and again this was the picture that we had before. 
Now what we will do is we'll look more carefully how do we implement this ORAM eval, basically the, the algorithm that allows you to access memory uh, in sublinear computational complexity and without revealing the access pattern, how can you uh, achieve this providing privacy guarantees with respect to both parties. Again, if we are just having an ORAM protocol uh, on its own, the, the kind of guarantee that it provides is that I'm the client, I put my database over there, I want to access things in the database, uh, and I want to do this with sublinear computational overhead, but I don't want to hide from the client. You, you don't want to provide any privacy with respect to the client. The client is the owner and he can learn everything. Now that we are in this setting of two-party computation, we want to provide privacy from both parties, both the guy who is storing the, the database, which now can include input from both parties. This database is not only uh, the client's database, but it's the combined input of both parties. And we want to provide privacy from the two guys participating in the computation, because this would re relate to the uh, security uh, guarantees for the overall uh, protocol that's the execution of a, of a whole function. So now in the efficient protocol, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we'll try to basically look at the construction of Godreich Ostrovsky and what is happening there. And we'll try to minimize what, what is the size of the garbled circuits that we'll, we will need to, uh, to use for the execution of that, of that protocol. So in the generic construction, the only thing that we said is like take whatever that protocol is, put it in a two-party computation, in a generic two-party computation, which is basically the garbled circuit evaluation, and you will get the privacy guarantees. However, so this, this gives us the theoretical guarantees of polylogarithmic overhead. This already helps us to get the, uh, this improvement. However, such a circuit will be kind of complicated in the sense that uh, these protocols for ORAM include many encryptions, decryptions, evaluations of pseudo-random functions, reshuffles. So this whole thing, although it's kind of hidden in the, in the uh, computational complexity that we get through the uh, generic protocol, uh, for practical purposes, this will incur substantial overhead. So we'll look more carefully at what happens uh, in the specific construction from Goldreich Ostrowski, and uh, we will try to tailor it m to making it more practical. So basically, we'll minimize the garbled circuits uh, to uh, Boolean comparisons, to, so that the garbled circuits we'll have to use will include only uh, comparison, and then XORs, which XORs in practice for implementations turn out to be free. XOR can be free, and then we'll have a single multiplication. And I have the star there because we, have, we are working on something that actually gets rid of the multiplication in the garbled circuit at all. And another contribution that we will have is that we have a new construction for a, a pseudo-random function, but pseudo-random function that both uh, that the input, the output, and the key are shared between the two parties. So for in order to uh, get into the optimized construction, I'll have to uh, tell you what is the uh, ORAM construction that, that was presented by Goldreich Ostrovsky. So uh, an ORAM uh, construction stores your database or your memory is organized in this leveled structure, where if you want to store n items, your database has n records, you want to have a structure that has log n levels. And then in each level, i, you will be storing two i minus one real items. And then you have to store some dummy items and some empty items. Uh, as I describe the protocol, you will see why you need this dummy and empty items. But think of, it, of this that each next level will be larger and larger. And it will include all these kind of different uh, items. So also remember that this uh, memory structure will be stored at one of the parties, uh, the, the one that has enough memory. So all the items will be encrypted. So everything in, in this uh, 
uh, in this database will be encrypted. So additionally, each of these levels that store different items or different records from your database is divided into buckets. And uh, each bucket will contain uh, a number of, of different records. So uh, how do you assign a particular uh, record to a database uh, bucket is you, you'll be using this uh, uh, hash function, which will need to have the properties of a PRF. And this means is that if you have some record and you want to find where you will put it in a particular level, is you find this position evaluating the PRF function on, on your item. So basically, an item with virtual with this virtual address will be assigned to the bucket uh, with number the hash function evaluated at the virtual address. So now if you want to look, if you are searching for some particular address V, what happens is that uh, you will be scanning everything that is stored in the first level of the uh, ORAM structure and you will be checking whether it's present in any of the positions of the top level. So the top level acts as, in a sense, as your cache, where you have to scan everything in that top level. And from then on, you will be checking one bucket in each of the uh, subsequent levels of the ORAM. How you would be deciding which bucket to check in each of the following level is by computing this PRF function or this hash function on the virtual address that you are looking for. So in the second level, you will take, take the uh, H2, which is the hash function that's corresponding to the second level. You will evaluate it at V, and you will be looking up uh, that bucket in, in that level. You will look at all the records. You will retrieve all the records that are stored in this bucket, and you will check whether each of any of those matched uh, what you are looking for. So these buckets will contain a few different records, and you will know that if your record is present in that level, uh, it has to be in that particular bucket. So you will be doing this check level by level until uh, you find what you are looking for. So imagine that in this level, we have found the element that we are looking for. Since we want to provide the guarantees that our access pattern is not leaking what we, when we, we found the item that we were looking for. From that point on, after we have located the real item, we start looking at random places for the remaining levels. So up to the level where we find the, the, the data that we're looking for, from that point on, we'll be looking at random places in, for the remaining uh, part of the ORAM structure. And the way we'll be choosing these random uh, places is basically by doing lookups for this type of dummy items. This will be the, the role of this dummy item, is that they will help us actually choose a random indices. And why we have to go through dummy items, I will not explain now, but there, was, there is a reason that why we need dummy items as opposed to just choosing random index. So now that we have scanned all these levels, we have done the lookup in all at, at one bucket in each of the levels, what we will do is we will take the item that we found it and we'll write it up on top in the top level. So we will scan again the top level, we'll, first, we'll find the first location that's empty and we'll put that item there. So why do we need to move the item to change its place in the, in the ORAM structure is, the reason for this is that if we will do two consecutive lookups for the same item, we want to find it in different places. If it stayed in the same level where we find it the first time, this means that during the next query that's for the same item, this we will have to touch exactly the same place in that level, and this would already review information that you are looking that these two queries were exactly for the same item. But now that we have placed it on the top level, we always, in each query, scan the top level completely. So in the second query that, that will be for the same virtual address V, 
we will find it on the top level. And from that point on, for all of the remaining levels, we will do just these dummy queries, which will result in completely different access pattern from what we started with. So now that at each lookup, we are moving elements to the top level, we are running to the problem that these levels will start filling up. And once we start filling up levels, we will have to, uh, to free space somehow. We'll have to start moving elements from some of the top levels down. So what happens is when a level uh, fills up, you will take the elements in this level and you will move them to the level below. And the way you will move them below is that you will take the elements of two consecutive levels, you put them together, you want to shuffle them and write them back into the, into the new level. So during this shuffle, uh, basically you will be choosing a new hash function or a new PRF function that will assign elements into buckets into this new level. And the type of guarantees you want to do during this shuffle is basically that you are hiding from the server from the party who is holding the database, how you are shuffling the elements, how you are reassigning the, the elements from the previous two levels that you're merging into the new buckets. So the blue and the red in, in the first, in the top row, uh, basically mean the, the elements that came from the two different levels that you're merging together. And the, the thing that you will do is you will permute them and then you will assign them to buckets. Bucket one, bucket two, and bucket three. However, this uh, hash function on, or PRF function, it might happen that assigns different numbers of elements into the different buckets. And in order to hide from the server how full each bucket is, you will use these empty elements that I was mentioning before. So you will fill up all the, your buckets with empty elements uh, and in order to hide from the server uh, how, how full these, these buckets are. And all of these things have to happen in such a way that the server who is storing the data and who has the, the large uh, memory is not learning anything about how elements are assigned to buckets and how full each of these buckets becomes. So for this, for the, in order for this to happen, uh, you will have to use things like uh, oblivious sorting, which basically means that you are able to sort uh, in such a way that the access pattern in which you are retrieving items uh, doesn't reveal anything about the, way the, the permutation that you are sorting according to. I mean, these are some technicalities that I don't want to, to go into, but th this is some of the tools that I used to realize this shuffle. So the privacy from the server in this case, why it comes is that between two shuffles, if we think about the accesses that are made between two shuffles, we have the property, we're ma maintaining the property that we never look for the same virtual address uh, more than once in the same level. And this comes from the fact that each time we, have, we've, we found an item, we move it back to the top. So any subsequent lookup for the same item between two shuffles will be found on the top level. Uh, so, the server doesn't learn where this item was found because you keep on doing these dummy queries after the point that you, you have located the item. And of course, between two, after, after a reshuffle, what happens is that if you look at the queries before and after a particular reshuffle, they are independent because you have chosen a new uh, pseudo-random function that assigns elements to buckets in these levels. So I want to make a point that uh, actually the size of the buckets in this whole scheme is, is very important because, because of, the, of the reason that I was mentioning that we don't want the server to learn whether an item was found in a particular level. And the problem with the size of the buckets is the following that sometimes you will you don't you want to prevent overflow of the buckets what what does what does overflow means is that uh, you get more queries that end up touching the same bucket than the size of the bucket if this happens 
what the server can conclude is that in this sequence of queries that touch the same bucket, and they're more than the size of the bucket, you had at least one that wasn't found in that level. And that immediately reveals to the server the fact that uh, one of these, like that some of this query was, was found in a different level, which is a leakage about uh, the access pattern of the queries. So in order to, to achieve this, uh, you have to guarantee that a level that's of size n, or you're holding n elements, will have to have buckets that are of size at least uh, logarithm of n. If you have, you, you are required to have this size in order to uh, guarantee that the probability of overflow of a bucket will be negligible across the number of queries that happen between two reshuffles. So, yeah? If you have a bucket of size x and you access it more than x times, then there can only be x unique items in there, and so at least one of those x plus one queries wasn't satisfied by that bucket. Yes, this means that at least one, you know that there were only x queries, and you know that each one is for a different for a different item, so you will know that this one didn't match there. And you're trying to prevent the server from being able to recognize in which level you found something or you didn't find it. So there, I had, we've been asked this question, why didn't use, why did we go and use uh, godrej hostrovsky scheme as opposed to this more, more recent one that uh, is claiming to achieve a better uh, uh, better uh, complexity, which is basically the one from uh, crypto last year, Pincus and Wyman. So, and the, the reason why we didn't use this one is that there is an issue with, with that scheme. And I'll try to like briefly point out what are the issues. Is So in that scheme, uh, the assignment of elements for, of elements to uh, positions in a particular level is done through this uh, specific uh, special hash that's called uh, cuckoo hash, so you no longer have buckets. So forget about the buckets. So you have directly assignment of uh, elements into positions in a particular level. And uh, again, you have uh, real and dummy elements, which are both assigned through this hash function. So now uh, the thing is that you have some positions in the level that are filled and you have some that are empty. This comes just from the nature of the hash function that you cannot have a, a contiguous range that is all assigned to, to, to items through the hash function. And the way their, their uh, scheme functions is that the server actually learns which of the positions are full and which are empty. So now what happens is that uh, when you do a query for an item that's not in that level, that's not present in that level, and wasn't found above, you will have a non-negligible probability that you will touch one of the empty squares because you are looking for a real item that wasn't allocated through the cuckoo hash in that, for that level. So with high probability, it will go to the, with non-negligible probability, it will go to the, some of the empty squares. If the item was found above, you are guaranteed that you will make a query for a dummy item, and this query is guaranteed to, to touch one of the full positions because the cuckoo hash was created uh, with, the full and the, uh, with, the full, uh, with the real and the dummy queries. However, if you are searching for something that will be found later in some of the subsequent levels, then you will end up touching one of the empty squares, and this will reveal to the server the information that you actually didn't find this item in this level. So one of the fixes, you can think of fixing this by just doing another permutation that you go over the empty and the full squares. However, this doesn't solve completely the problem, and this problem was independently uh, uh, pointed out by, both by us in our work and then at the work of uh, uh, Mitzenmacher and Goodrich uh, that's in ICALP this year. And basically the, the problem is that uh, relates again to this overflowing uh, part that if you have two sequences of queries, uh, it's likely that 
the sequence of queries that are not present in this level and will be find, found later will produce lookups that are incompatible with the KUKO hash table, which means again that you will hit basically one square more times than what you are supposed to hit it uh, uh, if, if this was an element that was allocated through the, uh, for, to the level through the KUKO hash table. So if you, uh, if you probably you understood this if you have looked uh, at the two protocols and you know what, what's going on, but I just wanted to point out for those who, are, uh, who know the, the scheme why we didn't use the Pincus Ryman. So as I said, now we want to improve uh, the two-party execution for the ORAM access uh, in a better way than just a generic one that will put everything in the, in the circuit. So what we will do is, uh, again, we will use the small circuits that will basically include only a comparison at each level. Then we will use this new PRF that we'll construct to assign elements to buckets, hiding, hiding what is this assignment from both parties. And then we'll have some efficient uh, decryption uh, for the garbo in the garbo circuit so remember that uh, we were looking we had to look and compare uh, our what we're looking for with a bunch of elements at each level so how we would do this is that we will implement in secure computation just this comparison that we have this item that we're looking for and then we have all the all the uh, records that we retrieved from the bucket so we need to compare this item to each of the elements of the bucket. So this is what we will have in our garbled circuit. And then the state that each of the parties will keep uh, will be uh, either a share of something random if we haven't found the element in the above levels or at the point when we hit and we find the level, the two shares of the two parties will be now shares of the uh, item or the data that we found. So. Uh, at each level, we'll have this secure computation where the two parties give the, the two shares. If we have found the items, whatever happens in that circuit doesn't really matter. It's, it's some comparisons that we don't care about. If the item hasn't been found, we are comparing the virtual address that we are looking. For example, five uh, is, is the element with virtual address five in, among the records that we retrieved from this bucket. And if we find it, we return shares of the data that's retrieved from that, that was found at, at virtual address five. So the question is, how do we, how do we know which, which uh, bucket we have to, to get? We, in order to, to uh, tell the party that's holding your database, give me the elements from bucket number five, we have to evaluate uh, a PRF or this HI on the virtual address. And the virtual address is shared between the two parties, right? Each party has a share of this virtual address. So we can imagine doing this, doing this in a garbled circuit by implementing AES in a garbled circuit, but this uh, would result in 30,000 gates for a, a Yao garbled circuit that's implementing uh, AES. So what we, what we do is we have a construction of a, a shared uh, oblivious PRF and the functionality that this uh, uh, this primitive implements is that you have both the key for the PRF shared between the two parties the message on which the PRF will be evaluated is, evaluated is again shared between the two parties and then the output of the PRF will be also uh, shares that are given to each of the party so in this case uh, what you would think is that the message that you want to put in the PRF is your virtual address, and then each party will have part of the key, and then at the end, each party will receive a, a share of the, of the PRF value. So this sh sharing the final output of the PRF will be important only in the shuffle part. In the lookup part, just one of the parties will send its share to the other one, the one that has to locate the, the appropriate bucket, or from the database and retrieve that bucket. So for our construction, we use the nor Rheingold PRF and the kind of functionality that we will achieve is that this PRF, the key again will be shared and the message will be shared, but I don't have 
time to go into this construction. So uh, just to point out is that initially what you get from the, the PRF is that you have these shares that the final value is the first one exponentiated to the second share. And then we run a special protocol that allows us to transform this into multiplicative shares. And this is where we have the single multiplication that we need to perform in the, in the garbled circuit. But we have now a protocol that allows you to get the multiplicative shares and actually get to additive shares. So now we have this way we have located the item. Now we have the secure, the, the circuit that allows us to compare values. However, if you remember, the items that we are retrieving from the buckets are all encrypted. So uh, we can, in order to be able to do this check, whether we have found the, the, the correct item or not, uh, we have to do a decryption. And decryption in a garbled circuit is actually very expensive. If you're using like a, a regular public key encryption scheme, the decryption becomes very expensive. So the way we will do encryption is in this special way. Uh, here f denotes a PRF function. And the key for this PRF function will be held only by the weak party that ha doesn't, doesn't have memory. So the weak party will have this, the key for the PRF function. And in order to encrypt the value v, the encryption will be the XOR of this value v with the PRF function uh, evaluated at some random point R, which will be also part of the encryption. So now if you want to decrypt some value, what happens is that uh, the guy who has the encryption, the, the party that's holding the database, will send the randomness to the guy who has the key for the PRF. That guy will evaluate the PRF on this randomness. And now the input for the garbled circuit or the decryption in the garbled circuit becomes the single uh, XOR, which is free, of this part. And then the other guy will input as his input the uh, PRF function e evaluated at the randomness. So now the decryption in the garbled circuit becomes this single XOR, uh, which, which is uh, uh, basically free e for an implementation of a garbled circuit. So this is the way we want to, to do efficient uh, uh, decryption in the circuit. And the, sorry? Does it mean that uh, two party has have to jointly encrypt the data items in the initialization phase? So yeah, the initialization phase when you, uh, when you do, you have, to, you, yeah, you have to run the protocol where you write an item into the database. Yeah. This already takes care of this, the, the fact that in the encryption you will... That means the database can only work for one specific user. So you, they are, this is one of the open questions is you, you can't have, we don't know how to do an ORAM protocol where you can have multiple users okay. using the, the, the database, yeah. So all, all existing ORAM protocols can work with one, with one client. And, and this comes from the fact that the encryption, the, this one client knows the, the key for the encryption. So, and I will really skip what's going, I, this is just a repetition again of what, what is happening in, in the lookup. And then we have to be careful what's, what's going on in the shuffle when we want to merge two levels because now we have to be hiding the permutation and how items are shuffled from both parties. So here we crucially use this, this property that the output of the PRF function is actually shared and nobody none of the two parties learn what is the exact uh, PRF output. So we managed to get a, a protocol that allows us to uh, sort and shuffle the items without revealing to either of the parties uh, what is the new permutation uh, that assigns uh, items to buckets in the new level. And so now the exact uh, the exact overhead that we are getting is if we have a protocol that's running in time t on a RAM machine, and then we have a database of n elements, and each of those elements is of size m bits, then under the DDH assumption, uh, we achieve a, a protocol, a secure protocol for the evaluation of this function against honest and, and curious adversary that basically has this polylogarithmic amortized uh, computation and communication overhead. And 
Again, we have constant memory storage for one of the parties, for the weak party, and the other party which is storing the database, we need uh, uh, a storage that's linear in size of the size of the database. Basically, in this database, if you're, th if you're thinking that both of the parties had some huge input, then both of, the, both of inputs get written into this ORAM structure and they're stored just on one of the, on one of the parties, the one that has enough, enough memory. And just in summary, so we introduced the first uh, general secure computation protocol that allows us uh, to do actually computation on large inputs and achieve uh, uh, computation complexity sublinear in the size of the database. Uh, or polylogarithmic in the size of the database. So open directions for improvement is definitely improving the overhead of this oblivious memory access when we have to, to provide privacy for both parties. It would be nice if we can get some better, uh, more improved construction for the, this shared pseudo-random function because the one now requires interactions. So this would be interesting and the question that you mentioned, support for multiple clients. We don't even have an oblivious RAM protocol that allows us to, to deal with multiple clients. So if you now want to do this database allow computation for multiple clients, it would be nice to get something there. But the, the problem is again encryption and who holds the keys for the encryption. So I would like to thank you and if you have any further questions, take them now.